So welcome to the second part of our first lecture as we move over to ancient Egypt, the other great civilization of the Near East, uh, centered in roughly what corresponds to modern Egypt along the Nile Valley. Uh, so just to make clear, uh, much of the time period we're going to look at here concurrent with what we saw in Mesopotamia. So kind of developing side by side. Uh, so how did the ancient Egyptian civilization come about? It might surprise some people to know I think most people are familiar, right, that, uh, you know, the Nile Valley surrounded by desert, uh, in particular the Saharan Desert to the west. Uh, and so some people might be surprised to know that there was a time when it, the what constitutes the Saharan Desert today was quite a lush, uh, well-inhabited environment. Uh, but at some point, the climate be became much drier, much hotter, and we, we begin to see the emergence of this great desert and people started to become more concentrated in the Nile Valley. And so that kind of, you know, maybe corresponds to this theory we talked about where civilization develops as a response to a, a challenge that had presented itself to a large number of people. Certainly as the population grows in the Nile Valley, it's creating the material uh, potential for the development of civilization. Uh, and the Nile is really ideally suited for this, right? It's a very fertile flood plain surrounding it, so very, uh, you know, physically suited for the development of an agricultural centralized society. Uh, so, you know, by the way, we're going to see that most early civilizations, but maybe not all, develop around major rivers. You know, we have the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia. Here we have the Nile. I do want to point out the Nile very different from the Tigris and, Euf and Euphrates, right? Uh, much more predictable, related to which it, it becomes seen as this kind of life-enhancing rather than life-threatening force. And that might be a factor in, you know, kind of how uh, the, the way the ancient Egyptians conceive of the divine very different than Mesopotamians. Uh, you know, kind of much more nurturing than the Mesopotamian gods and goddesses and so forth. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's one major difference. We should also know that because the Nile is so tame, it's very easy to move up and down it. Uh, so probably served as a unifying factor in the sense of, of you know, people all along the Nile uh, really developing a sense of a kind of shared culture and shared identity. I do want to say one last thing about the Nile, just so people don't become confused. Uh, if you hear the terms Upper and Lower Egypt, you know, part of the problem is we're so used to seeing uh, on a map, right, that the north should be on the top and the south on the bottom, uh, that then when you hear a term like Upper Egypt, you just kind of assume that it must be the northern part, when in fact, it really reflects more this idea of working your way into the interior. Uh, so Lower Egypt would be on top if you're looking at this map, Upper Egypt on the bottom. And related to this, the Nile, uh, one of the few rivers in the world that actually flows from south to north, right? So just wanted to point that out. Uh, but again, the Nile, uh, you know, very suitable for navigation, uh, very suitable for agriculture. And one last factor we might note that uh, in as much as the Nile Valley is surrounded mostly by desert, Mediterranean Sea to the north, uh, very well protected from invasion by outside forces, right? They'd actually have to go across the desert or across the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, Egyptian civilization able to develop to some degree unmolested. Now, when we look at the history of ancient Egypt, it's kind of interesting that we adopt a chronological system that the ancient Egyptians use themselves. You know, from a much latter point in their history, but looking back, uh, they came up with a scheme of dividing Egyptian history into three major periods, the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom, collectively consisting of 31 dynasties, right? So dynasties, again, uh, meaning ruling families. And each kingdom marked a period of stability characterized by strong monarchies, right? So uh, part of what sets them uh, apart from one another is that uh, there was kind of a breakdown in the political and social order. Periods of instability, uh, often referred to by the present day historians as intermediate periods, right? So, you know, everything going along well in the old kingdom and then things break down. You have this intermediate period but then somebody's able to, you know, kind of reunify the territory, 
kind of stabilize it, and then we have, in this case, the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. But, by the way, uh, it's not simply a breakdown in stability that sets the One Kingdom apart from the other two. Uh, in some ways, I mean, there's a lot of consistency, you know, kind of shared Egyptian civilization, culture, way of life, uh, kind of religious system, and so forth. But there, there are, in each case, certain characteristics that really distinguish each kingdom from the other two. And so I'm going to highlight that. That also becomes kind of a useful way for thinking about the overall history of ancient Egypt. We'll start with the Old Kingdom, which uh, precisely begins in 2686 and ends in 2181 BCE. I don't expect you to remember the exact dates, but it's kind of nice if you have a basic idea about roughly what time period we're looking at. Uh, and so this is really when all of the Nile Valley becomes united into one kingdom. The Old Kingdom, probably the most defining characteristic and the, you know, kind of a characteristic of ancient Egypt that most people are familiar with is the construction of the Great Pyramids, right? And I think most people imagine that this kind of thing was going on for the entirety of ancient, uh, ancient Egyptian history, but that's not the case. Really only took place during the Old Kingdom, uh, after which they stopped building pyramids, right? So, I mean, obviously, what does that tell us about the Old Kingdom? Uh, there's certainly a high degree of wealth, the availability of surplus, uh, surplus resources based on a very productive and stable economy enabled the state to sponsor the construction of something as monumental as a pyramid. And by the way, there are other colossal monuments from this period, um, you know, exceptional works of art and so forth. Uh, the pyramids uh, themselves, uh, and most people know this, like the pyramids were actually burial chambers for the pharaohs. Right. So, I mean, think about that. Right. The actual chamber where the pharaoh would have been buried would have been quite small. Right. So, you know, obviously uh, the bulk of the pyramid uh, structurally not necessary in any functional way is basically there to symbolize the the authority of the pharaoh, his greatness and so forth. It's a monument to the pharaoh. Right. And, and probably the most famous pyramids are the pyramids of Giza. Uh, which you see here. There are three uh, kind of, you know, all adjacent to one another. By the way, what I find interesting with this photo, and this is, you know, very typical. If you're very careful about how you do the photography, you can create the illusion that these pyramids are just out there in the middle of nowhere. When in fact, and it's slightly visible to the right, it is adjacent to the city of Cairo. The city of Cairo literally comes right up to these pyramids. Right. And, you know, back in the day, there would have been many other smaller monuments, an entire complex uh, built around these pyramids. Uh, the surfaces were much uh, smoother. A lot of the stone was basically uh, cannibalized from the pyramids for the building of other monuments later on. Uh, but, you know, think about it. These are burial chambers. That is pretty much what they are. Um, and by the way, there are many other pyramids. Uh, some of which uh, are older than these and provide some, uh, some indication of the, uh, you know, the fact that it took a while for them from an engineering point of view to really work out all the problems with building a structure this big. Uh, so the earliest pyramids in Egypt were step pyramids, not unlike the ziggurats that we find in Mesopotamia. Later on, if you go further out in the desert from Cairo, you can find pyramids where they have a very steep incline about two thirds of the way up. And then suddenly uh, the uh, degree of inclination becomes less sharp. And what happened is that they were building it uh, too high and they realized that if they kept going. Uh, the way that they had started, it would collapse under its own weight, right? So they you know, kind of still working out the bugs uh, from an engineering standpoint on how to build a pyramid uh, with smooth sides, uh, you know, in a way that it would remain stable. Uh, I kind of always wondered what would have happened to the architect when he had to let the pharaoh know that he had screwed up in this regard. But in any event, eventually they did work it out. And again, right, the main point is that they are burial chambers for the rulers of Egypt known as pharaohs. And pharaohs in Egypt, unlike kings in Mesopotamia, not agents of gods, they are gods, right? Related to which they have absolute power. 
Uh, but they have tremendous responsibility for maintaining universal harmony. By universal harmony, I mean harmony between this earthly realm and the divine realm, maintaining the cosmic order, if you will. And there were very, very specific ideas uh, about how that had to be achieved. First and foremost, in terms of underlying principles about the nature of things, what we call cosmology. And we're going to see that term again, right? Cosmology is, you know, reflects a particular conception uh, of reality that might extend to include the spiritual realm. Uh, but also there are many, many very specific rituals that the Pharaoh had to carry out exactly so in order to maintain the cosmic order. Probably the most important principle was something called Ma'at, a spiritual concept related to the idea of truth and justice. Right, so the Pharaoh would embody this particular principle. Uh, and so long as he was able to do so in an appropriate way, would preserve the world in harmony. And that is kind of worth noting, right? So, you know, on the one hand, this idea of absolute power, but that doesn't mean that a Pharaoh could just, you know, pretty much behave in a, you know, tyrannical, arbitrary way. I mean, there were very, very clear expectations about his behavior and that the well-being of Egyptian society depended on it, right? And, you know, the burial chamber related to this, the idea that when the Pharaoh dies, right, he will have an afterlife, uh, related to which his corpse would have been mummified, right? That's probably a pretty well-known aspect of, you know, kind of rituals connected with, with the afterlife in ancient Egypt. And he would have been buried in the burial chamber with all the things that he would need in the afterlife, right? So not just, you know, kind of utensils and weapons, uh, perhaps even slaves who are buried with him, rather unfortunate for them, um, uh, but, you know, just all kinds of tremendous wealth. Of course, uh, later on, after the kind of collapse of ancient Egyptian civilization, many of these burial chambers will be robbed, right? So, uh, you know, very often uh, later on when historians and archaeologists entered them, they found very little uh, of the tremendous wealth that had once been there. In any event, the Old Kingdom comes to an end at some point. We're not, in clear, not entirely clear as to why. Uh, could have been a number of factors, food shortages, which might have led to famines. Definitely there does seem to be indication of political rivalries that might have resulted in small-scale civil wars. Uh, but eventually we, we have the collapse of central government and Egypt becomes politically fragmented into a number of smaller kingdoms, uh, but is eventually reunited by a king from the city of Thebes, uh, Mentuhotep. And that marks the beginning of the Middle Kingdom uh, in ten, uh, 2055 BCE. And there we see an image of Mentuhotep's tomb. And as you'll note, it's not a pyramid. Right, so at some point, it's quite monumental, I mean, to be, to be fair, right? I mean, obviously pharaohs, uh, you know, have not become particularly humble in this regard, uh, but they're not building pyramids in any event. So what defines the Middle Kingdom, right? Uh, well, this is often defined as a period during which Egyptian civilization really flourishes, right? It really becomes more about... Uh, kind of intellectual and artistic achievements, uh, but also, you know, kind of uh, promoting of the welfare of the more common Egyptian people, right? So definitely, uh, you know, beginning with Mentuhotep, the country becomes much more prosperous and stable. Uh, you know, the different parts of Egypt are re reunited, lost territories are reconquered. But we really, the thing that defines it most is that you have this kind of resurgence of art, literature, monumental building projects, and so forth, right? So, you know, just really, you know, it seems a period where the, the common folk are doing much better. Related to this, one very important development, the democratization of religion. And what I mean by that is you had these ideas about an afterlife, you know, about preparing uh, the body for the afterlife, ensuring that they had the necessary materials for it. Uh, but that, you know, during the Old Kingdom, that really only applied to pharaohs, you know, really political elites, very important people. Uh, that was, you know, really the afterlife was not for regular folk. That changes with the Middle Kingdom, right? There's, they're kind of developing. This is, again, coming back to this term cosmology, 
right? They're beginning to develop a clear sense of what they imagine the afterlife is about. And related to that, uh, the idea develops that all people possess souls and therefore could in potential achieve the afterlife. So for instance, you see the spread of mummification. This becomes a much, much more common practice. Uh, two gods, brother and sister, Osiris and Isis become extremely important in connection with the afterlife. Uh, Osiris becomes a symbol of resurrection, right? The idea that after you die, uh, and there's kind of a physical aspect to this, but that somehow in the afterlife you are resurrected. Uh, and important to this also, the idea of judging people to determine whether you're worthy of achieving an afterlife. Right. So this is kind of an interesting development, a bit more familiar to people coming out of, say, Christian, uh, Judaic or Islamic tradition, where, you know, whether you make it to heaven depends on being a good person. Uh, according to the tradition, uh, when you die, you would stand before Osiris with Isis, his sister behind her, uh, and your soul would be put on a scale uh, and weighed against a feather. And if it proved to be lighter than the feather, it meant that your soul was pure and therefore you were worthy of an afterlife. If not, your soul was cast uh, into, into flames. So it wasn't that you went to hell per se, but you, you were just simply obliterated. Uh, and by the way, there are some interesting stories connected with Osiris. According to the Egyptian religious myth uh, about Osiris, he was killed by his brother. Uh, who then chopped him up into small pieces and scattered him into the Nile. Isis found, the, he, she's not only his sister, but his wife, by the way. And uh, I should note the practice of brothers marrying sisters uh, was common among pharaohs. But in any event, she found all the small pieces of his body, collected them, stitched them back together, and he was reborn. Uh, so, you know, this kind of idea, he basically personified this idea of resurrection. Uh, and it is interesting to note, I mean, this idea of resurrection, uh, of, you know, God being killed and then somehow reborn, uh, is central to the Christian faith, which doesn't mean it was borrowed, uh, but it is kind of interesting that you have this similarity. We should note also that during the Middle Kingdom, one very important god will be the sun god, Re, which becomes tied to the pharaoh, who is considered his earthly embodiment, taking the title Son of Re. Uh, again, a very interesting parallel with the Christian faith, the idea that uh, this earthly being is both God and the Son of God, right? The Pharaoh is the incarnation of the God Re, but his title is the Son of Re, very similar to how the relationship of Jesus to the Father is often portrayed in the Christian faith. Uh, in any event, he becomes a very prominent God during the Middle Kingdom, related to which the city of Heliopolis, which is, by the way, its Greek name, and the Greeks were familiar with ancient Egypt uh, uh, at some point. Uh, so in this city, a very important sun cult dedicated to him will develop. Now, in terms of the flourishing of culture, literature, art, and so forth, we should say a word about Egyptian art which, while very distinctive, and most people, if they see uh, Egyptian art, they recognize it as such, uh, very formulaic, largely functional, right? So it wasn't art for the sake of art. Uh, usually you were painting, uh, either painting or statues, they were there to serve spiritual purposes. In some cases, it could even be almost like an instruction manual. So for instance, in a burial chamber, a lot of the art was there to actually provide kind of guidance uh, to the dead individual, uh, leading them into a proper afterlife. Um, some rituals uh, which are aimed at preserving the cosmic order would have also been centered around kind of appropriate artistic symbols, uh, depictions of different gods and goddesses, of the pharaoh and so forth, right? But others aiding the journey of the deceased into the afterworld. And as I already said, right, very formulaic. And what I mean by that, uh, you know, again, not art for the sake of art, it's not about an individual's uh, artistic expression, right? If you become an Egyptian artist, there's kind of a canon, right? There's kind of a set of kinds of images uh, you know, ways in which you're supposed to portray figures and so forth that you must adhere to. You have to conform to a strict canon of forms and proportions. Uh, so probably most famous 
is the profile, right? Where you have kind of both a side and frontal profile combined. Uh, you know, this kind of idea of walking like an Egyptian, right? There is some of you guys are all too young to remember the song, Walk Like an Egyptian. Uh, but even today, I think if you said like, uh, you know, oh, you should walk like an Egyptian, you would have a mental image of what that looks like, right? So definitely this combination of profile, semi-profile, frontal view, uh, when depicting the human body. Uh, probably another very familiar uh, element of Egyptian art is, you know, where you have the human body with the head of an animal. And those very often represented different gods and goddesses. Uh, and finally, we should note, uh, if we're talking about uh, kind of cultural flourishing or development of literature, we should talk about Egyptian writing. So with the Mesopotamians, we had cuneiforms. Here we have hieroglyphics, a Greek term meaning priest carvings or sacred writings. So again, not a phonetic alphabet, made use of signs that depict objects, and then you would combine signs to depict uh, maybe more complex objects uh, or ideas or uh, verbal actions and so forth. Uh, and so again, like to become a scribe, you would have to be trained for years, right? I mean, it's gonna be a huge alphabet or a set of symbols, if you will. Uh, and by the way, the signs were considered to have sacred value, hence the Greek term, priest carvings or sacred writings. Now, I did want to mention one last thing, and I didn't bring this up with the cuneiform writing, but both with respect to hieroglyphics and cuneiform, we know today how to read it. Uh, and that's actually quite an achievement because nobody uses these writings anymore. Uh, no one writes in them, no one reads in them, and for quite some time, in both cases, no one knew how to read them. So how does one learn to read a dead script of a dead language, right? Uh, language and script that no one really uses anymore. Uh, instructive in this regard might be how we learn to read hieroglyphics, and that is connected to an artifact known as the Rosetta Stone. And by the way, the company takes the name from the artifact, not the other way around. So uh, the Rosetta Stone was discovered by a French uh, soldier during the time of the French occupation of Egypt. And this is at the very end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. This was under Napoleon, by the way, another story. But in any event, this soldier found this stone uh, near a village called Rosetta, hence the name. And it basically showed the same, it was kind of a, uh, a decree, that, a royal decree that had been issued during the, what's known as the Hellenistic period of rule in ancient Egypt. Uh, you've probably heard of Cleopatra, she's from that period. But in any event, it had the same passage, right? The same thing written in three languages. Two in Egyptian language scripts, uh, one of them uh, a phonetic Egyptian alphabet that developed much later. Uh, and one in Greek. And they knew how to read the Greek, and they were able to kind of work out the Egyptian uh, phonetic script, right? Partly because they knew it said the same thing. Uh, and so here's the thing if you kind of know what, you know, like a passage in its entirety is saying, you have the possibility of working out kind of the underlying structure. It's kind of like breaking computer code. And so a team of British and French scholars were eventually able to decipher the hieroglyphic symbols by comparing the languages, right? Uh, so this dated back to 196 BCE, but the hieroglyphic writing was not that much different at that point. It was still the ancient hieroglyphic writing. Uh, and then eventually based on that, uh, they were able to expand their understanding of hieroglyphics and so forth, right? So, you know, this is pretty much uh, the same kind of process that's going to replicate itself with respect to other dead languages. But imagine that up until, uh, you know, the end of the 18th century, nobody knew how to read hieroglyphics, meaning you had all these written documents, uh, you know, some of it on monuments, some of it on papyrus. Uh, ancient Egyptians used a kind of almost kind of paper known as papyrus, uh, which was great, but not very helpful if you don't know how to read it. And so up until then, a lot of guesswork based primarily on the archaeological records. You might imagine suddenly having the ability to read uh, Egyptian script would have been a monumental breakthrough and probably would have led to a lot of reinterpreting. 
in any event, the Middle Kingdom eventually comes to an end. Uh, this time, we really have kind of one specific reason for it, uh, kind of an invading force, a people known as the Hyksos, uh, who basically bring the Middle Kingdom to an end around 1650 BCE. We don't know a lot about them. They were an uh, Asiatic uh, people uh, who had at some point started settling in the eastern delta of the Nile. Uh, that's in that kind of triangular area where the Nile empties out of the Mediterranean. And from there eventually seized control of all of ancient Egypt. Uh, so 1650 BC is kind of interesting. Some some historians have speculated whether maybe this might correspond to the uh, biblical tradition of the Hebrews who at some point had settled, the Hebrew tribes had settled in Upper Egypt, eventually enslaved and then liberated by Moses. Uh, the timing doesn't quite work out. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of other uh, inconsistencies with respect to that theory. Uh, I did want to mention, so I mean, it's just kind of, you might come across that, but we, I should point out, apart from the biblical tradition, we really have no evidence of uh, anyone known as Hebrew tribes being enslaved in Egypt. We're pretty sure actually that, you know, the great monuments weren't built primarily by slaves anyway, uh, but certainly little evidence of, uh, a, you know, Hebrew slaves being there. Certainly nothing corresponding to the, uh, the exodus under the leadership of Moses, uh, you know, the miracles associated with it, the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but from a historian's point of view, you'd love to find any kind of Egyptian historical record uh, corroborating that. It's kind of like in a court of law. I mean, if you only have one witness to a crime, you're kind of like, gee, we'd like to have another witness that can kind of, you know, ends up saying roughly the same thing. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Egyptians are famous for obliterating you know, kind of, uh, you know, on any monument, if you have a, a pharaoh who didn't like the preceding one, trying to eliminate any reference to that individual, have to imagine the Egyptians wouldn't have been, you know, promoting uh, their defeat at the hand of a bunch of rebel slaves. Uh, but nonetheless, right, we, we don't have any evidence outside the biblical story. And the Bible is a historical document, uh, as well as a religious one. But, you know, it's what we call an interested one. Its primary concern is with promoting a system of beliefs, not just providing an account of stuff that happened. Uh, you know, kind of interesting to think about it. In any event, the Hyksos uh, pretty quickly adopted uh, Egyptian uh, manner of government, Egyptian, uh, you know, kind of clothing, use of the Egyptian language and so forth, but were never really accepted by the native Egyptians, who eventually rose up against them and had them expulsed from Egypt, that marked the beginning of the New Kingdom. And the New Kingdom is going to run from 1550 to 1070 BCE. And probably the, de the defining characteristic of the New Kingdom is that it's very imperialistic. And the word uh, imperial, imperialism, right? Everything associated with kind of building of empire, controlling other people, right? So this is a period where the Egyptians are going to expand the territory under their control. And the military related to that becomes the central priority for pharaohs. And Egypt is going to extend its influence either directly or indirectly to the north into Syria, to the south into Nubia. You know, sometimes it's militarily, you know, literally just, you know, sending the army in and conquering territory. Uh, other times more by diplomatic means where it's more about influence. But again, right, defining characteristic imperialism which doesn't mean that you don't have beautiful monuments being built during this period. Uh, in some ways, uh, you know, building is on a larger scale than what we saw during the Middle Kingdom, but certainly no pyramids. A uh, really good example would be the temples. The, it's kind of like a temple complex dedicated to the god Amun in the city of Karnak. Um, so I've actually had the pleasure of going here. Uh, and these are quite large. If you were standing in front of this, you wouldn't even really come up to the knees of you know, any of these figures that are depicted here kind of at the entryway to the temple complex. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the monuments built to gods and goddesses, but also you have monuments constructed to glorify the achievements of pharaohs, uh, or it could be a combination of both. But remember, pharaohs are gods. So here we see the temple of Ramses II. By the way, that's the pharaoh that we find in the biblical accounts. Uh, so it doesn't line up with the Hyksos chronologically. 
Uh, this temple dates back to 1279 BCE, uh, or roughly thereabouts. That's actually the year that Ramses II, also known as the Great, ascended the throne. Uh, and he would build an, an awful lot of temples, statues, obelisks. That's a very typical kind of Egyptian structure, uh, kind of looking like the uh, Washington Monument in D.C., which is modeled after Egyptian obelisks. Uh, he's also famous for having uh, just an infinitely huge amount of children, right? I mean, Pharaoh's had multiple wives, so you know, it wasn't one woman responsible for this. Uh, but there's kind of a joke in Egypt today that pretty much everyone can claim descent from Ramses II. Uh, one last thing, by the way, this temple, uh, believe it or not, uh, and you can see a couple of figures in front, so you can get, get a sense of its scale. It was actually, uh, in recent times, was completely disassembled, crated, uh, relocated to another point in Egypt, and then put back together again. Uh, because its original location would eventually uh, end up at the bottom of a lake when they built uh, the High Aswan Dam. Right? But I just find it always very impressive, you know, that... You know, something of this size could be disassembled and then rebuilt somewhere else. Uh, though we're going to find out that that kind of thing would happen a lot uh, with other ancient structures in, for instance, the Middle East that end up in European museums. One last thing really worth mentioning in connection with the New Kingdom and more specifically the reign of Ramses II. Uh, we have evidence of what many historians consider to be the first recorded peace treaty in history from 1258 BC that concluded the Battle of Kadesh uh, against the Hittites, a people uh, to the north who had established a pretty powerful empire in roughly what corresponds to modern day Turkey. Uh, so they basically fought uh, at a place called Kadesh, uh, which corresponds to uh, what today we might refer to as either Israel or Palestine. And the fighting basically resulted in a tie or a stalemate. So they negotiated a settlement uh, determining who had a, would have influence in which regions and so forth. So, you know, that's kind of a, you know interesting early development uh, in the history of diplomacy. In any event, from this point forward, it's pretty much a story of decline for the ancient Egyptians. Their wealth made them a target for invasion. We know that there were two peoples in particular that really gave them uh, a hard time. The Libyans, uh, people to the north in roughly what corresponds to present-day Libya. And another people uh, that historians refer to as the Sea Peoples, we're not really sure who they were, uh, but we know that they were frequently attacking uh, the Egyptians by sea. And then there were other problems, kind of more internal problems like corruption, uh, you know, the usual suspects, uh, tomb robbery, uh, and eventually civil unrest that brought about Egypt's decline until, you know, they would be uh, conquered by various peoples. Finally, their independence brought to a complete end by Alexander the Great. At this point, uh, I would like to look at another civilization that emerged uh, roughly at the same time as the ancient Egyptians and Mesopotamians. Uh, and this uh, would take place in the Indus River Valley in India. Uh, though if you're looking at the territory there, it kind of corresponds to roughly where the border between modern day India and Pakistan uh, is located. So this civilization emerged between 3000 and 1500 BCE. And the two most important archaeological sites correspond to two major cities, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. They do have written records, but here's an example of where we haven't yet figured out how to read them. So most of what we know uh, is coming from the archaeological record. Uh, so what we do know, I mean, very highly developed civilization uh, in terms of, you know, kind of all the accoutrements of major cities. There definitely, we have evidence of extensive trade with Mesopotamia and so forth. But as you might imagine, um, if you're a historian of this ancient civilization, what you're really hoping to do at some point is crack the code and figure out how to read their writing. Now, if we're looking at India... Uh, and we're, we're thinking about kind of the development of the Indian civilization that we have today. Really the, the most important development uh, related to that, in some ways kind of the starting point, would be when uh, this kind of new culture enters India around 1500 BCE, the Aryan culture. 
Uh, and sometimes we say Vedic Aryan culture because much of what we know about them comes from their sacred texts known as the Vedas, most likely written down beginning in 700 BCE, but relating many stories and myths and aspects of their culture that definitely predate that, uh, that point. Um, the term Aryan, though, is a bit tricky. It doesn't really refer specifically to an ethnic group or even a linguistic group. Uh, the term means noble or freeborn in their language, Sanskrit. Uh, and this would have been their kind of literary language, which isn't always the same thing that people spoke. Uh, so, you know, it could actually encompass a large uh, number of different uh, ethnicities and so forth. Now, some of you might be thinking, gosh, I've seen that term Aryan before. Uh, so it definitely has an association with the Nazis from the 1930s and 40s where the term Aryan uh, kind of referred to this concept of a master race, the idea that the Germanic people were the Aryan people and were superior to others. Uh, so this kind of really does represent a misappropriation of a term that uh, up until then had uh, a kind of more legitimate application uh, up until the, uh, the early 20th century, and this really kind of starting in the 19th century, uh, the term Aryan applied to people who spoke an Indo-European language, right? So Indo-European, and that's the term we're going to see again, uh, referring to a family of languages that had a common point of origin, probably somewhere in Central Asia. Uh, so, you know, eventually the people who spoke it migrated into different directions. And as they moved further away from one another, the languages that they spoke would evolve in different ways. Some of these people moved south into India, and that's kind of corresponding to the Indo part of that term. Others made their way west, uh, some of them settling in what would become Persia or Iran. And by the way, Farsi, the language spoken in Iran today, is an Indo-European language. It is not a Semitic language, such as Arabic or Hebrew, different family. And then uh, other groups would continue to migrate further westward, eventually coming into Europe. So uh, most European languages are, are also part of this Indo-European language group. Right? So it kind of means, for instance, that Farsi spoken in Iran is in some ways more closely related to, say, German. Uh, than some of the neighboring languages like Arabic, even if it did borrow some words and eventually the script from Arabic. Uh, during the 20th century, the Nazis would misuse the term to refer to a white master race, even going so far as to adopt uh, a Hindu symbol that came from India, the swastika, uh, though they would modify it. You can see it there uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, but, you know, historians still use that term, but it is a bit tricky. You kind of have to somehow uh, sometimes remind people that uh, we're not referring to uh, this concept of a master race, right? It has to do with people who speak Indo-European languages uh, and then eventually migrated to different regions such as India, the Iranian Plateau, and then onward into Europe. So coming back to the Aryans who migrated into India, what do we know about? And maybe it, it is good to say Vedic Aryans, right? Then we know that we're talking about those individuals that migrated into India. So what we know about them, uh, based on the Vedas, they were a semi-nomadic uh, people, uh, kind of warriors. I mean, uh, they valued greatly martial skills. Uh, we're pretty sure they kind of migrated in groups, you know, kind of small tribal groups, uh, mostly uh, horsemen and cattle herders. Uh, so they would introduce many kind of new cultural elements into the northern part of India, where they eventually settled. New language, uh, new basis of social organization, definitely new techniques of warfare, and most importantly, new religious forms and ideas that would eventually lay the foundation for such world religions as Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. So we're pretty sure they first came into the Punjab and Indus Valley around 1800 to 1500 BCE. That's roughly corresponding to where the Indus River Valley civilization uh, had existed prior. And then uh, after that, between 1500 BCE, kind of penetrated more deeply into the rest of northern India, pushing down the Ganges River. And this map gives us a pretty good idea uh, regarding the 
uh, the manner of Aryan penetration of India. Uh, hopefully you can kind of make out the Ganges River there in the center. So it's kind of moving down from the Himalayas and moving down in a southeastern direction until it eventually hits the Indian Ocean. And so the Aryans kind of made their way down the Ganges River. And by the way, the Ganges River would end up becoming uh, a very holy, sacred river uh, with respect to Hinduism. So that kind of corresponds to perhaps the, the manner of interaction between the Aryan people early in their history and that river. So concerning the Vedas, uh, the Vedas consist of four major compilations of ritual, explanatory, and speculative text, right? So you have, uh, they're kind of grouped into four different uh, categories uh, to some degree reflecting their chronological development as well. So the oldest are the Rig Veda, and they pretty much correspond to the earliest history of the Aryan people between 1700 1000 BCE. And what we find uh, in these texts are mostly hymns about early conflicts. Uh, for instance, one praises the king of the Bharatas. And by the way, this is where the Indian name for modern day India comes from, Bharat, land of the Bharatas. Uh, so, you know, a lot of myth, a lot of uh, great battles and, and kind of epic stories about relationships between kings and princes and so forth. Uh, you know, how much of it reflects actual people is debatable, but it does definitely tell us something about the social hierarchy of the early Aryan people, uh, their value systems, and so forth. So uh, between 1500 BC, again, this is a period where the Aryan are beginning to move down the Ganges River and eventually, uh, to some degree, displace whatever uh, people were already there uh, in the northern part of India, pushing them further south. Uh, this is a period often referred to as the Late Vedic Age, uh, sometimes called the Brahmanic Age, uh, because it's during this period that a particular priestly caste emerges as kind of the dominant uh, social group, the Brahmin class. And this is definitely reflected in the most important Vedic text from this period, uh, commentaries known as the Brahmanas. And here we see a Brahmin sitting in meditation, right? So this would be the priestly caste. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with the fact that in Indian society, you have something called a caste system. So we're starting to see that take shape here. Uh, but it's something that's going to continue to evolve for a long period of time. The late Vedic age is also sometimes referred to as the epic age, uh, partly because two of the most important epics in uh, Vedic literature uh, are set during this period, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Uh, and particularly the former is, this is one that actually you find, it's pretty easy to find like in bookstores. It's one of those books that very often sit on, on some learned individual shelf, uh, but never actually gets read. I'm guilty of that myself. Uh, so it's a, you know, a, probably one of the more famous texts related to Hinduism. And I should be careful here. Hinduism hasn't quite taken form yet, uh, but the foundations for what will become Hinduism uh, are starting to be laid. In any event, both of these texts reflect the complex cultural and social mixing of Aryan people with the earlier inhabitants, right? Many of whom, whom are being kind of pushed further south, but some of whom are going to intermix with the Aryan people. So looking at the Vedic text collectively, we get a pretty good idea about this new Aryan society that is beginning to take shape. First of all, patrilineal, succession and inheritance running through the male line. Marriage, likely monogamous with widows able to remarry. That actually would have been a fairly progressive uh, thing for that time period. Largest social grouping was the tribe ruled by a chieftain or Raja a term that would come to signify king in Sanskrit uh, and a position that would eventually become hereditary. So we see the beginnings of kingship and then uh, a chief priest looking after the sacrifices on which religious life was centered. We've already established that the priestly caste is a very important social group. And most importantly, the beginnings of the caste system 
uh, which really defined an individual's place uh, in the social and political hierarchy. And regarding which there also emerges kind of a fundamental division between nobles and commoners. So by the late Rig Vedic period, uh, you have basically four categories. At the very top, the priestly or Brahmin caste. Just below it, the warrior or Kshatriya class, and these two groups would collectively have constituted the nobles, the individuals who had political power, had social status, and so forth. Uh, next would have been uh, the peasants or tradesmen, the Vaishya, and then finally the servants or Shudra at the bottom, and both of those were considered to be commoners. Uh, and some of you might be thinking, well, wait, I thought there were, you know, five castes within the Indian caste system. So, you know, at the very bottom, but I mean, really so low on the totem pole that they're effectively not on the pole are the Dasas, right? What today we often refer to as untouchables, uh, if we're talking about the caste system in India. Uh, and so in a sense, they're kind of like a non-caste. They, unfortunately, there's kind of a racial quality here as well. The Dasas very often corresponding to the darker conquered people uh, who had uh, who had been residing there when the Aryans came in. And so they constitute a socially excluded group. So at this point, what we have is a kind of broad Vedic religion uh, that eventually will inform the development of three very distinct religious traditions, Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism. Uh, so kind of summarizing what we have at this point, central Vedic cult, controlled by priests, who, by the way, double as a military aristocracy. Uh, polytheism, right, belief in many different gods and goddesses. And so this will carry through to these other religious traditions I just mentioned. Uh, and a real emphasis on ritual and sacrifice as a basis for maintaining order in the universe. And, and that, by the way, very similar to what we already encountered uh, in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. We also see in some ways kind of the development of a very distinct cosmology, right? And I, I really do need to, uh, we're going to come back to this quite a bit, right? But the term cosmology, uh, kind of referring to uh, a particular people or a group, could be a religious group, their, their particular worldview, or how they conceive of reality, the nature of the universe, actually, right? So it really is, is kind of all-encompassing. Uh, and so that might include, for instance, kind of, you know, certain ideas about the spiritual realm or non-earthly realm, forces of the universe, etc. To give an example, Christian cosmology would include things like, you know, ideas about heaven and hell, uh, ideas about the nature of existence, uh, the nature of the soul, what happens to you when you die, uh, more specifically, the role of Jesus, uh, you know, and so forth, right? Uh, you could talk about a scientific cosmology, uh, where, you know, you, this kind of idea that you really uh, discount anything that you cannot quantitatively evaluate or measure, see, smell, touch, feel, hear, and so forth, right? Like you, in some ways you discount the idea of a spiritual realm, but that is a cosmology. So in the case of India, we're seeing the emergence of a cosmology that to some degree will be shared by Hindus, Brahmins, and Jainists. And related to that, I want to just very quickly look at the latest Vedic texts, the Upanishads, where they really start to explore, you know, how they view the universe in its entirety. And the term Brahmin, while corresponding to this priestly caste, actually has a broader significance. It originally meant the ritual word of power, right? Later, the divine power present in sacrifice, right? So it's kind of the idea that these rituals that you carry out somehow gain you access to a deeper reality, kind of more spiritual dimension, if you will. The priests then are the guardians of ritual, the masters of Brahman, right? They are kind of the gatekeepers, if you will. Eventually, the term Brahman comes to mean the absolute. This idea that beneath the kind of day-to-day -day fluctuating impermanent reality that we experience in our lives, there's something kind of deeper and more impermanent, a kind of more real reality, if that makes sense, because it's unchanging, right? So it's this kind of transcendent reality, and the term they use is Brahman. And 
what ends up becoming the goal of each individual soul is to find a way to come into connection with this deeper transcendent reality, to even become one with it, right? And so, you know, I don't want to get too much into this. When we get to the second chapter, we'll kind of explore the development of Hindu and Buddhist ideas related to this. Uh, but the idea to kind of, you know, give you a short definition of how it works, the idea is to kind of lose a sense of your own individuality and to become one with the universe. And the way they might put it is that, you know, we are all like drops of water who, when we're apart from the sea, have a strong sense of our own individual selves, right? But when we enter the sea, we become one with the ocean, right? So, you know, just something to ponder for now. We'll definitely be coming back to that. Uh, but I'll leave you with one other thought. This is this kind of idea of a transcendent, deeper, unchanging reality is going to appear in a number of different religious and even philosophical traditions, for instance, even in Greek philosophy. And it is really kind of interesting to realize that this is going to happen in each case independently of developments elsewhere. It's not a case of borrowing this idea from one place to another. Uh, you know, all indications are that they arrive at these ideas on their own. So just kind of wrapping up things with the first chapter, we should look at developments in China uh, and then in the Americas. But starting in China, we're pretty sure the civilization emerged in northern China along the Yellow River about 4,000 years ago. And that the first civilization that we can speak confidently of is the Shang Dynasty, uh, which existed between 1750 and 1122 BCE. Uh, I say the first that we can be confident about because uh, there are certain stories and traditions about an earlier dynasty known as the Shia, but we don't actually have any written uh, uh, archival evidence or uh, even any archaeological evidence of its existence, right? We only know that at some point uh, stories existed about it, right? Uh, as far as the Shang state, what do we know about it? Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of the, the different elements that might make up an early civilization, pretty standard fare, bronze-based, urban civilization, huge royal palaces, irrigation, uh, you know, prosperous agricultural society, ruled by an aristocratic warrior class, right? So we've seen these elements before. Uh, one thing that was kind of distinctive, uh, the Shang religion, which was based on oracle bones, uh, the idea that they would use bones, priests would use bones to practice divination, you know, trying to know the will of the gods and so forth. They definitely believed in many gods and goddesses uh, that were, you know, reflected the different forces of nature. Uh, but they did believe in a much more powerful uh, deity above. Uh, so kind of, a, you know, somewhat corresponding to how Christians and Jews and Muslims might conceive of God. Uh, probably, though, in terms of practice, the most important thing uh, religiously for Chinese uh, early on was this, uh, to make sacrifices to the ancestors, right, to the ancestors of your family. Uh, in the hopes that they would then intercede on behalf of the family with the deity above. Uh, finally, human sacrifice was definitely very common. Uh, so, for instance, when the king died and was buried, hundreds of slaves and prisoners would be buried with him. The Shang eventually came to an end at the hand of the Zhu around 1050 BCE. Uh, though it's important to note, uh, and this kind of reflects uh, the development of Chinese civilization as a whole, the Shu pretty much uh, assimilated the culture established by the Shang. Uh, and so there's throughout the history of China, there's always a great deal of continuity culturally in terms of kind of this, you know, overarching civilization where, you know, even when you have people coming from outside of China and conquering China, establishing themselves as the rulers, they very quickly assimilate what's already on the ground. In any event, the Zhu will carry on until 771 BCE, uh, and they will fall to a barbarian invasion. And it's around this time that a very important concept develops known as the Mandate of Heaven. So first of all, heaven is not a place in Chinese cosmology. Uh -huh, there's that word again. Uh, it's not uh, uh, an individual either. It's not like a godlike figure. The 
best explanation I could give is kind of like the, the force of the universe, if you will. Maybe not unlike the way uh, in Star Wars they talk about the Force. By the way, uh, George Lucas, who created Star Wars, borrowed many of his ideas from Eastern religious traditions. Uh, but in any event, right, th there's kind of this idea that uh, whoever the ruling dynasty is, if they're no longer looking out for the welfare of the people, heaven withdraws their right to rule, what they call the mandate to govern. Right? So the mandate of heaven, the idea that the Shang had uh, lost the mandate to rule due to their wickedness. And eventually the mandate to govern, the mandate of heaven, is then given to another dynasty. Uh, and that brings us to another uh, point. Uh, occasionally when a dynasty comes to an end, an empire comes to an end, China does you know, politically fall apart, become politically fragmented. But inevitably, someone is able to reunite China. And this is one, one way in which uh, developments in China differ greatly from how things evolve in Europe, right? So when the Roman Empire, for instance, comes to an end, Europe is never able really to pick up the pieces. Indeed, you could argue that the European Union is the latest, you know, maybe, hopefully will be successful attempt to unify Europe. In China, whenever things go to pieces, eventually someone is able to reunite China. You know, it might take a few hundred years, but, you know, uh, within the broader scope of things, that is not a long period of time. And so there is a great deal of continuity in that regard as well. Well, in any event, with the fall of the Zhu, uh, China will become politically fragmented for a few hundred years between 401 and 256 BCE, what's known as the Warring States period. Uh, but what's kind of interesting, uh, a lot of really positive developments happening during this period nonetheless. So, for instance, making the move from bronze to iron, uh, which is going to allow them to expand agricultural land. I mean, iron tools much better for farming certain kinds of, of soil than bronze. Uh, this is also go going to see an expansion of the population. We're going to see a rise in commerce. Uh, and that's actually really interesting because very often when things break down politically, that has a negative consequence on trade and commerce, but in this case not. And merchants are actually going to come to rival the land-owning lower nobility in wealth, right? So they're doing pretty well during this period. And we see the creation of a new kind of army based on a cavalry and large numbers of conscripted foot soldiers. So military innovation during this period. So we'll finish our discussion of developments in China with one last aspect that is actually really unique to China if we're talking about the pre-modern period in that they had really huge, well-developed bureaucracies, something uh, that you don't really find in the rest of the world until the modern period. Uh, so first of all, what is a bureaucracy? The short answer is uh, bureaucracies are, you know, government in action, right? Bureaucrats, the people who make up the bureaucracy, these are the people who make government happen. And so, for instance, if we're talking about the United States, I'm not talking about elected officials, I'm talking about uh, civil servants, right? People who work in the post office, in the DMV, uh, most importantly, the Eternal Revenue Service, right? Uh, that's probably the most important because if you don't have revenue, then you can't pay uh, bureaucrats to actually carry out the business of government. Uh, so these, you know, the people who sit behind desks, who push papers around, who file things, keep records, who send out letters to make sure people, uh, you know, pay their taxes or make sure that people are appropriately registered to carry out certain activities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to meet environmental standards like the EPA. This is this is a bureaucracy. This is how it works. And throughout much of history during the pre-modern period, most, most states did not have well-developed bureaucracies. China is the one notable exception. Bureaucrats, bureaucracies became very important from an early point, related to which uh, it was considered imperative that bureaucrats be properly changed. So we see the development of different academies or schools to train a literate bureaucracy. Uh, and, you know, in terms of their education, not just kind of practical, 
skills and so forth, but also, you know, that they should have the right moral attitude, that they're looking out for the welfare of the people, that they don't become corrupt and so forth, that they're highly educated. So members of the bureaucracy, often known as she, meaning scholar bureaucrats, right? These are learned men uh, who very often engage in other kinds of activities uh, other than just governing. Uh, but, you know, the, the Chinese didn't really see these two things as mutually exclusive. Now, from an early point, again, you had large numbers of schools that were developed, very often with different philosophies about, you know, how best to train uh, bureaucrats. Uh, early on, we talk about the period of 100 schools, right? So this represented really like 100 different philosophies about how to properly educate future bureaucrats. Um, so we're going to stop there, but just to give you kind of one spoiler uh, about where we're headed, one school in particular uh, headed by one, one individual is going to emerge as the dominant school, and that is the one, uh, the, the philosophy promoted by a fellow named Confucius. So uh, finally, we come to the Americas. Uh, so this, you know, we're just going to kind of look at developments here very briefly. We're pretty sure that man migrated to the Americas during the last ice age uh, over the Bering, uh, Bering region between Siberia and Alaska when it had frozen. And some of you might be familiar with this. It is possible that small groups of people had made it over sooner or had arrived uh, in different fashion by ship. Uh, but we're pretty sure that the bulk uh, of humankind that eventually settled in the Americas came across the Bering Straits. So in North America, for a long period of time, mostly hunters and gatherers, though by around 4000 BCE, we have evidence of agriculture, the cultivation of maize or corn. Eventually other crops become very important like potatoes, squash, beans, peppers, and tomatoes. All of these, by the way, originating in the Americas. Uh, so prior to Columbus, uh, arriving in the Americas. Uh, people in Europe did not eat any of these foods, just, you know, kind of by the way. Uh, the most complex civilizations that develop in North America, uh, we do find kind of large kind of agricultural, pseudo-religious trading centers. A good example would be Cahokia, uh, the site of which is located near the city of St. Louis. Uh, they didn't have writing though, and most of them collapsed before European contact, so our knowledge of them is somewhat limited. More conventionally in terms of complex civilizations would be developments in Mesoamerica. So we have some really highly sophisticated civilizations emerging, uh, roughly corresponding to the time of the New Kingdom in Egypt. The earliest was the Olmecs, which uh, existed between 1500 and 800 BCE. Uh, in Central America, Mesoamerica, and they had cities, writing, sophisticated calendar systems, complex social and political structures, you know, pretty much all the things we expect to see when looking at a highly developed early civilization. We'll finish by just very quickly uh, looking at some developments in the Andean regions, uh, not quite as, uh, you know, in terms of uh, civilizational developments, not quite as complex and sophisticated as what we see in Mesoamerica, but still very interesting. Uh, just to give one example, the city of Caral, which dates back to around 2600 BCE. Uh, so not quite as uh, sophisticated, again, as the cities that we find in Mesoamerica, uh, but very interesting. Probably the most interesting uh, fact related to Caral is that, you know, unlike most civilizations, not directly connected to a fertile river valley, uh, though they did have a pretty sophisticated system of irrigation that allowed them to divert water from a river about a mile away. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, but we'll stop there. This really concludes our discussion of Chapter 1. Uh, do make sure to read Chapter 1, to do the quiz on Chapter 1, and look for your first assigned reading, uh, which again will be concerning the relationship between religion and civilization.